show will show. Uh, and that is um, the speaker series, as you know, we have the speaker series and then the social, the networking social afterwards with pizza uh, at around noon. And that social is sponsored, this whole quarter has been sponsored by the Next Generation IT Club. And so we want to give them a little bit of time to come up and tell you about their work. <laughs> No, I didn't. Thank you, Brian. Thank you all for showing up. Those of you that are new today, thank you for showing up. It was uh, an opportunity to join uh, to educate you on our speakers. So, um, no. so uh, we've got a couple of cool events coming up called uh, the uh, Spring Tech Fair. And it's coming up uh, in May 18th uh, at the uh, middle of next quarter. And we'll have uh, this entire room set up with uh, workstations and little projects that you can kind of get your hands on and experiment with uh, web design, networking, uh, database design, game design, and uh, play some games that uh, some of the, the student body has created. Um, well, the slideshow running with uh, uh, screenshots of uh, projects that uh, the student body has submitted to us. So if any of you have a, a web design project or a photo of uh, a class project that you created and you want to share that with us, you can email those to uh, our email at tngtic uh, dot cascadia at gmail.com as a JPEG attachment. Work those into the, the slideshow. Um, we have Linux Fest coming up um, at uh, April 28th, 29th, 30th, uh, 27th, 28th, and uh, the rooms, the, the space in the room just went fast. What is Linux Fest? Linux Fest is a, uh, a Northwest uh, conference, trade show, all about open source software, the latest and greatest uh, releases of uh, Linux and other open source software. Hardware that's based on open source uh, hardware design where you can uh, uh, freely uh, share the schematics and the chips design with your friends and not worry about violating copyright information. Uh, and then there's a, uh, a big uh, a raffle. You can win uh, all kinds of hardware and software and books and stuff. Uh, and uh, then there's a, a big uh, gaming feast uh, on Saturday night where they can get together and network and, and catch up with uh, friends, make new friends, uh, play games. They have about three different kinds of gaming platforms set up uh, that you can play the latest and greatest games. Um, and that's up in Bellingham at the Community College in Birmingham. So we need to travel up there on the, on, on the vans. Um, we've got uh, all the seats are filled in the van currently, but uh, if you can make it up there on your own and you let us know you want to go in time, we can uh, reserve a room for you. There, you won't have to pay for your room or your when we only have one driver, so if somebody else wants to call, uh, is faculty and wants to volunteer as a driver for us, let us know. We can take two vans then, then yeah. nobody has to drive. When is that? Sorry, what day? What's that? What day was that? Uh, the 27th, 28th, and 29th of April.
the technology programs here to other students who may have some interest in it, but don't really know what it's all about and, and might you know, learn something about it, might then that spark an interest for them and they start you know, this path of learning about technology. So if you can think of some, think back to when you started in this area and something that got your attention and was interesting to you. And then if you can think about a way that you could find a, a fun way to make that accessible to other people, you could even set up a little station here that day and sort of you know, spend a couple hours here you know, encouraging people to try this little website design or you know, put together this little program or a little JavaScript program online that you know, did something. And you see those light bulbs go on as people realize, oh my gosh, you know, I see this stuff all the time, but I can really do it. And it can be really fun to, to kind of put that together and move move into that place of encouraging someone else like you've been encouraged in your process. That feels really good too. So think on that. Just connect with the club. Um, they're working hard on getting that all, the structure of it scheduled and set so you could just step in and do that one little piece and make a, make a real contribution. Well, with that, um, Really excited to introduce our speaker today and to um, hear what uh, Neil has to say. So Neil Evans is joining us from Microvision today. <laughs> so Neil has been in the industry, it's been here for over 18 years, uh, working in this uh, field in um, IT management and at that senior and executive uh, management level, uh, CIO level, Chief Information Officer. Um, this here at Microsoft, Real Networks, and at BCC, Bellevue Community College. So some you know, amazing experience that he's going to be sharing with us today. And he's currently working at Microvision uh, as um, their CIO, or uh, effectively that. And uh, just a short uh, information about that, uh, a former student here, uh, Matt Carmine, I don't know if you ever ran into Matt there, but he worked at Microvision for a number of years, We've got his um, his um, degree here in uh, web programming, then went to uh, UW Bothell and got a CSS degree there, and took both of those and went up to Microvision and worked there for a number of years. Um, really had a, a very successful time there. He's moved on from there now into you know, the next part of his journey, but um, he, he has had a great experience there, and it was really, uh, really wonderful. With that, we'll welcome me all. Okay, I'll be going to use the uh, microphone. Can you hear me in the back? It's a, it's a so we, if we shut that door. Well, I don't want to be tied up. have a wireless. Yeah, wireless. That'll be good. So we already have some technical problems. So when I say this presentation, I say that on a network drive, um, which is usually a good idea because there's a backup of it, but I forgot to save it locally, so we had to email it to me this morning, but I think we're good now. So, um, thanks for having me speak today. Um, this is actually one of the best times in, in, in history to be an IT professional because technology is having such a dramatic effect on our culture and our society. Um, we're in a, entering a period where technology has the potential to solve some of the uh, world's um, most pressing problems, including uh, things like uh, overpopulation, food, water, energy, education, and commerce. It's, it's no coincidence that Bill Gates went from uh, you know, heading the world's largest software company to heading the world's largest private foundation. And he's addressing a lot of these pressing issues. He, he went through this confirmation, uh, even when I was at Microsoft, where um, you know he, he was really into technology, and thought technology was going to change, you know, have it back across the world. He went on this safari kind of to Africa and he saw how people that did, you know, didn't even have clean water and, and things like that, um, and it, it really had a big impact. And that hit was its impetus to starting the foundation. And now they're addressing some of those the global health, global development issues uh, around the world. But applying technology uh, to those problems. So today I'm going to talk about what are some of these major trends in technology 
and what impact are they having on IT careers? So the components, uh, giga trends in IT preparing for next generation IT careers. I just put this together this week, so I have no practice on it. I'm gonna have to look my notes a lot, so just be forgiving. Um, I have about 20 some slides, it'll take about 20, 25 minutes. Save your questions till the end, and we'll have to go out plenty of time for that. So what's driving these, these 10 gigatrends uh, in technology? Well, it's these uh, four laws of technology. And when I'm done, I will uh, you know, email this to Brian and he can distribute it uh, for you to have a copy. So we all know about Moore's Law, uh, Gordon North of Intel in the early 1970s, after they invented the microprocessor, um, came up with this, what now called Moore's Law, that uh, in essence, computing power doubles every 18 months. He, he said in terms of transistors, but the effect of it is that computing power at the same price is, is uh, doubling every 18 months. George Gilder, who's a tech writer, author, came up with what's now called Gilder's Law of Information Networks. That network bandwidth is tripling every 12 to 18 months. So you get more and more bandwidth for the same price, um, you know, using fiber, and then uh, the same things are happening in wireless. Google's Law of Information Content is that information content is quadrupling, quadrupling every uh, 12 months. And here's some interesting stats. If you took all the uh, human written history uh, from the beginning till 2003, all of that data would, would uh, add up to five exabytes. An exabyte is 10 to the 18 bytes. So five exabytes from, you know, for 7,000 years from, uh, say, 5,000 BC till, till now. Then for 2000, no, I'm sorry, till 2000, three. So 2003, 2010, we were creating uh, five exabytes every two days. And now, this year, we're creating five exabytes of data every 10 minutes. So huge amounts of data are being created. And that's why I say information content is growing at this uh, exponential level. And then last thing, Zuckerberg, uh, named after Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, Law of Information Sharing. He says, the amount of information shared digitally doubles every 12 months. So people, uh, you know, this is being shared personally, commercially, and institutionally. Um, and that's what's driving you know, the success of social networks like Facebook. So the first trend I want to talk about is consumeriz consumerization of IT. This is a real big one having a big impact on IT organizations because now that, you know, the, the, the employee, the consumer is king, that employees are setting the standards for mobile devices within organizations, and IT is having to adapt to that. It used to be the opposite. IT would set standards, and everybody would have to adapt to that. You know, we're going to buy just IBM PCs. We're going to only need this version of Windows. And now, because uh, somewhere, uh, I'd say somewhere in the, uh, if you look at Google, I mean at Apple, somewhere in the last like five years, um, consumer technology, the spending of consumer technology exceeded that on, on, on business technology. And that consumers were actually creating the standards and companies like Apple were leading uh, in terms of technology and ease of use. And so people brought those things to work and they said, well, why can't I use these? And why can't it be just as easy at, at work as it is at home? So this is called BYOD, bring your own device. Uh, the expectation is that work computing should be just as easy as home computing. And therefore, uh, like in our organization, when I first came out there about uh, three and a half years ago, all we supported was, you know, I, was uh, Windows machines. And now we support Windows, Android, iOS, and Linux. So multi-platform is, is going to be standard across all organizations. Uh, the next one is the commoditization of IT infrastructure. This, uh, this man, Nicholas Carr, he's at Harvard, uh, wrote this book called The Big Switch. And he said that the digital revolution is a lot like what happened with electrification around 100 years ago. First, it started out that uh, companies would have their own power plants and they'd be located near uh, you know, wind mills and water wheels, and they would generate their own power. And then somewhere in the early 1900s, there became a, a utility to generate power, and everybody would just plug into that. And so we kind of see the same thing happening now with, with cloud computing, is that these cloud providers are providing the utility of computing, and there's no reason for companies to buy their own. Well, I mean, there's some reasons, but 
Um, it, a lot of it's going to start transitioning to the cloud because it's just more cost effective. And I'll talk about, oh, here's why. Uh, economies of scale. Uh, you know, companies like Microsoft, Google, Apple, and Amazon can buy and run technology farms, you know, server farms, much cheaper than any company can do that. Uh, elasticity of, of supply. So instead of buying a whole bunch of supply because you have, say, say you're a company like, well, Amazon's not a good example, but if you're a company that has big sales uh, at, in the fourth quarter before at Christmas, so if you're a consumer of the company, you, you're gonna, you want to staff up for that and you want to have enough technology available for that, more, more computers, more uh, transaction processing, so you'd have to buy more computing than you would use for the other th uh, three quarters of the year. Well, with, uh, with cloud computing, you can just use as much as, you know, you buy as much as you use, so it, it's elastic, goes up and down as you need it. Okay, and lastly, uh, it's very scalable. So uh, look, most startups now are using cloud computing instead of buying their own infrastructure. A whole bunch of startups, a whole bunch of uh, internet companies use Amazon, for example. Uh, and when Amazon had some couple failures uh, last year, uh, <laughs> then those websites went down, things like I think Yelp and uh, Foursquare, and some of these, these you know, pretty big uh, e-commerce sites. Um, depend upon uh, an infrastructure that, that's there all the time, like utility. So they're still working things out. I mean, it, companies like uh, Alaska Airlines had a big failure last year. Amazon had a, a, a big failure. A big failure means one day of downtime. I mean, because they design these things, they have total redundancy, total high availability. They should not fail at all, but, but they do occasionally. Next one I want to talk about is the explosion of what's called big data. So much data is being generated. I talked about that. Um, here, here's an interesting stat about, uh, I'm actually involved in the film and, and video industry. I'm an uh, independent filmmaker. And if you took all of the, uh, the content that, you know, the free broadcast TV, uh, ABC, NBC, and CBS, if you took all their content, the video content that they created from the beginning of TV, around 1950, all the way till now, so that's like 60 years. Um, that up amount of, of, of video, uh, YouTube is generating every every two days. So every two days, uh, YouTube is generating as much video content as the three networks for the last 60 years. So lots of stuff, and it's all good. <laughs> the quality is, is questionable, but the volume is definitely, definitely there. Um, and so what does that mean for companies? Well, for, here's one big thing is unstructured data is growing 80% a year. So IT is used to structured data that comes from their business systems, that comes from uh, spreadsheets, things like that. Well, look, a lot of this data now isn't structured. It's, it's video content, it's from um, social networks, it's from email. So there's a whole bunch of, you know, how do I make use of, how do I store it? How do I make use of that information? There's a strong link between uh, effective data management in a company and their, their financial performance. And this has created a whole industry called BI, or BIA, uh, Business uh, Intelligence and Analytics. So that's a whole huge field that's opening up. How do we make sense of all the data that's being generated? The next one is uh, the rise of social media. Well, we all know about that. Uh, and again, this is something that started in the, in the consumer or in the personal side, and now it's completely you know, uh, it's being, you know, Facebook is, you know, being funded now by ads. And so it's, you know, it's become very essential for companies to have a social presence. And so they're blurring the lines between personal and commercial. Like some companies, you know, say, well, you, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't go on your personal, you, know, you shouldn't go on your Facebook while you're at work. But most companies say, no, that's okay because, you know, we realize that part of your, uh, personal resources to, you know, is to have a social uh, context. And then companies are more and more uh, experiencing having to have a presence on these social media, a blurring between real and virtual self. Uh, uh, the diet. So traditionally, ads have been pushed out to consumers. Now with, with social media, there's a dialogue. A company can develop a dialogue with their customers and find out how do the customers like this stuff. You know, uh, Starbucks makes really good use. Uh, every time they're going to introduce a new product or, or create a new name for a product, uh, or actually, uh, uh, Toyota did this thing where they they have multiple uh, versions of, of Prius now. 
you know, there's the original and now there's the V and there's a plug-in hybrid. So they said, what do you call multiple Prius? Is, should we call them three I's? Should we call them Priuses? So they had a whole contest and then they, everybody voted and they picked one of them I think they call it Priuses. Um, and so this is where our companies are having a dialogue with, with, their, with their customers. And what this is called, the people within the company that represent the customer and understand the customer, we call that voice of the customer. Um, the market uh, technique of capturing a customer's expectations, preferences, and aversions, and that somebody within the company, usually within customer service, is the voice of the customer uh, in all the discussions that happen inside a company. Like, what would, the, what would our customers say about that? The next one is mobility, which is, again, that, these are called giga trends because these four or five trends are the ones driving uh, technology completely. And, Maybe hard to interpret this, but what it says is we're already in the post PC era. The more mobile devices are connected to the internet than PCs. Uh, th this happened last year, and one of those charts shows that. The, the yellow ones are, are uh, mobile devices, and the green ones are PCs. So we're already in the post PC era. Um, when Apple uh, Apple uh, announced yesterday they they uh, announced the iPad three. They said that in 2011, they shipped more iOS devices than any PC competitor. So it took uh, HP or Lenovo or any of them. Apple shipped more uh, mobile devices, which means either iPads, iPods, or, I, uh, <coughs> or uh, iPhones than any of the personal computer uh, companies. This year, there's already 4 billion uh, mobile devices connected to the internet. And by 2020, there'll be 10 billion. If you look back 10 years ago, 90% of the devices connected to the internet ran Windows. Now, uh, more than half run other, other things, either Android or iOS. This is a big challenge for Microsoft. The next one um, is a big trend within IT called software as a service. And here are the benefits of software as a service. Uh, and again, this is sort of versus on-premise software, which traditionally companies have bought software running on their own servers, and, and you buy it as a uh, as a capital expense, and you uh, run it yourself, and you have to do all these upgrades, and it's really complicated. But now that there's software as a service, and in my company, we were, about 80% of what we run is is hosted somewhere else. And we, so the benefits are. You only pay for the number of users that you have. Like we're, we're using Microsoft CRM 2011 online, and we have 24 users. And if we have more users, we can, you know, it's per user per month, you know, as many dollars per user per month. So it's very well, you don't have to buy a big one that has 100 users, and then only you have 24 of them. The next one is uh, the CFO likes this because it's, it's an operating expense, not a capital expense a monthly subscription. The upgradability, this is huge. 